Aloha Kako, uh, welcome and good evening everyone. My name is James Hustis and I'm the president of the Waimea Community Association. Uh, thank you for those joining us online tonight for our regular monthly Waimea Community Association town meeting. I encourage you to follow, like, and subscribe to the Waimea Community Association on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. You may also find relevant information and resources up on our website at waimeatown.org. We do strive to keep our accounts active and up to date. And at this point, I would like to recognize the WCA board members, our Vice President Michael Donnelly, our Treasury, Treasurer Jeremy Madrid, our Secretary Nancy Carr Smith, and our directors, Patty Cook, David Greenwell, Mary Beth Lechek, uh, Lonnie Olson Chong, and Riley Smith. Uh, on behalf of the Waimea Community Association Board, we are grateful for the support shown by you, the community, to hold virtual town meetings. Uh, thank you all for your interest in joining us for our past meetings and for viewing and sharing the recordings. Uh, you're welcome to revisit uh, these videos up on our WCA Facebook page or even up on our YouTube channel. The Waimea Community Association is a nonprofit organization that strives to promote open participation by all of the Waimea community, develop leadership, and support the smart growth of the region. If you'd like to support the work that we have done and help continue our effort in connecting with our community, you are more than welcome to donate and join as a member. And if this is something that interests you and you would like to receive more information, please email us at Waimea Community Association at gmail.com or visit our website at waimeatown.org. And on our website, you can find an option to contribute and join dig digitally, or you're welcome to mail us your membership form if you prefer, and you can find that form up on our website as well. Uh, your contributions and membership allow us to reach out and connect with the community in this setting and support the work that the WCA has done over the past 60 years. Mahalo Nui. So as mentioned, and for our agenda tonight, we'll be hearing some important news and updates. We will begin this evening by hearing about a couple opportunities that are seeking community involvement and input. We will then from, hear from our community policing officers. And following this, we will share a few more community updates uh, and spotlight our October nonprofit of the month. And for our main portion of tonight's agenda, we will be exploring and discussing the water resources of Waimea. This evening, we are grateful to present you a full and informative agenda. And after we hear from these community leaders and officials, we've allocated some time to share your questions uh, with our presenters. Uh, we do appreciate the member community members sending in their questions ahead of time, but we also try and capture some of the live questions for this portion. Please use the Facebook chat uh, to pose your live questions and we'll do our best to share them in a given time. And I wanna thank our WCA board members, Lonnie Olson Chong and Michael Donnelly for joining me this evening and presenting these questions. Mahalo. So first up, I would like to welcome Greg Chun, the Executive Director of the University of Hawaii Center of Mauna Kea Stewardship to highlight the Mauna Kea Master Plan and, request, and the request of community members to provide input. Welcome, Greg. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, mahalo. Uh, aloha mai kako. Thank you everyone uh, for uh, giving me a few minutes here to just quickly uh, brief, brief you on uh, the university's draft master plan that was released for public comment uh, a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to share my screen. I have just a few slides to run through real quick um, uh, just to give folks uh, an idea of, of uh, what it is that we're doing. Um, so the new, the new draft master plan uh, was released a couple of weeks ago for public comment. The public comment period runs through October 26th. Uh, the plan is named Eo Kaleo, uh, which uh, translates to listen to the voice. Uh, and it was uh, uh, developed based on uh, 20 plus years of feedback uh, that the university has received uh, regarding uh, astronomy on Mauna Kea. I won't go into all of that, right now, um, but I do offer uh, the opportunity for any groups who are interested in a fuller briefing uh, for me to come and, and provide a, a fuller overview. Uh, in addition, there are some other resources that uh, I'll, I'll cover as well. Um, first uh, question that uh, we often get is what is the master plan? So just kind of orientate you to, to, folk, uh, to what it is this plan covers. Uh, the plan, the draft master plan, uh, 
basically articulates the university's uh, intended uses of the privilege of access that we have to the, the summit of Mauna Kea uh, for astronomy uh, and how we intend to utilize that access in terms of land uses and our facilities. Uh, it sometimes gets confused with the management plan, which is a second separate document uh, that uh, was approved separately. And that, that is where uh, uh, the university's uh, plans and policies for managing uh, human activity, if you will, uh, on the Mauna uh, is, are, are covered. So the master plan is about land use. Uh, the management plan is about human activity. Uh, the plan covers the 11,287 acre Mauna Kea Science Reserve, which is our, our least area, uh, primarily at the summit. You see here uh, on the left. It also includes uh, our 19.261 uh, acre uh, parcel at Halepohaku, our mid-level facilities, as well as uh, uh, about a 71 uh, acre uh, uh, roadway easement uh, that connects the Halepohaku to uh, the uh, summit area and the observatories. The uh, goals of the plan, uh, well, the, the plan is, is, is organized into three parts. Part one is uh, where we discuss mission, vision, values, goals, and strategy. Part two gets into more of the specifics regarding uh, decommissioning uh, or land use, or, or land uses, which includes decommissioning, the reuse and recycling of sites, uh, our, our intended uh, ideas for repurposing Halepohaku, and uh, eventually a managed access program. Uh, what the plan does is uh, codify the university's commitment to uh, no more than nine uh, operating astronomy facilities on the summit uh, post 2033. It, it describes uh, the potential reuses of re decommissioned sites as well as re recycling of, of uh, existing astronomy sites. So reuse would be to be able to put this the site into uh, a use for public or non-astronomy use. Recycling means to, to reutilize a decommissioned site for uh, uh, ongoing or continued astronomy uses. Um, we also have a, a desire to expand our educational programming and services uh, through the expansion of Halepohaku uh, into a multidisciplinary field station that can support uh, a broader range of education and research uh, and the university's mission. Uh, part three uh, gets into implementation and um, um, covers project review and design guidelines. Um, these are the reasons why we're doing it. Um, I won't get into all of that right now. I, it's something I can uh, sort of cover if people are interested in a more detailed uh, uh, briefing. There are four, uh, three, uh, multiple ways that people can get, uh, provide their input. Uh, uh, we do have an interactive website uh, that people can go into and uh, directly comment on the plan or provide general comments overall, or people can uh, actually uh, call in. We do have a, a call in line that people can leave a, a verbal uh, uh, comments if they wanna do it that way, or people can uh, send in their comments uh, through traditional mail. We did hold a per virtual public forum, as some of you folks uh, were aware of, uh, that was held last night. That recording is now uh, posted uh, on YouTube and is available for, uh, for watching if you didn't have a chance to catch it. It gets into uh, a lot of the questions that have been raised about why we're doing this and what we, what we are doing. So uh, just wanted to, to provide this opportunity to, to sort of prime uh, folks with uh, what we're trying to do. And uh, uh, again, I make myself available for continued uh, or further discussions with different groups. Uh, if uh, you're interested, please just contact uh, me directly. I think James knows how to get a hold of me at this point um, and uh, we can set something up. So that covers my, my overview, James. Uh, I don't know if I've run out of time. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Uh, appreciate you being here with us this evening. And I know you're a busy man during this time with all of people wanting, wanting some feedback and learn more about the process. So we really appreciate you being on here with us to uh, sure. highlight this and uh, engage with the community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, wonderful. It's great to see you, Greg, and I appreciate the time joining us here.
Um, next up, I would like to welcome Commissioner Mezu Louie, who represents District 1, to share with us uh, some news and updates regarding the ongoing redistricting process at the county level. Welcome, Commissioner. I'll make sure you're unmuted there too, and then I'll let you have the floor. Thank you, fellow Commissioner Eustace. <laughs> um, as you all know, the census is taken only every 10 years. And at that point, we have to rearrange the districts because it wouldn't be fair if one of the county councilors represented 100 people and another represented 500, you know, and they had an equal vote. So we have to make sure that the districts have relatively equal numbers of people. Uh, Hawaii County grew by 15,000 people and it didn't grow equally in all districts. So we're gonna have to do some um, rejiggering of the map. Um, now, I don't know how many of you are math nerds or liked the story problems when you were in junior high and high school, you know, like Kimo has 99 bananas and he sells them for 15 cents a banana and, you know, 10 go rotten and he eats five. How much money does he make? That kind of thing. Well, that's really what our job is. We're looking at these numbers and we're trying to get the right numbers into each district. Um, and then the other thing is, I don't know whether you, any of you like jigsaw puzzles, because that's the other part of our job. Um, in order to get more people, for example, my district has 1,300 people too few. The optimum number is 22,000, and I only have 20,000 some. So I have to find some census blocks. Each, um, the whole island is divided into census blocks. But the thing is, these blocks are not the same size. They're not the same shape. They don't have the same number of people in them. So as we try to grab a block, we have to look and see, you know, how many people it is, in it, is in it and does it, you know, is it next to um, our district because we can't like jump across the island and grab a little piece of, uh, you know, Kohala to put it into Hamakua, that wouldn't work at all. The other thing we have to look at is geography. So we just heard from um, Greg Chun, you know, you don't wanna take, take a little piece that's over on the other side of the mountain. So there are geographical features that are natural boundaries. There, they could be um, a gulch, they could be a river, uh, they could be a forest, uh, could be Volcanoes National Park. So we have to take a look at that too. And the last thing we have to look at is kind of the social aspect. Um, so for example, as I'm looking to expand my district geographically, um, I'm next to Hilo, but I know that people in Hilo really have urban problems and they probably don't want to be in a district that's mostly agricultural. So with all of those factors, it's a complicated task, probably more complicated than I thought of when I joined. <laughs> um, and um, just for those of you who might be math nerds or who like jigsaw puzzles, apply to be on the commission 10 years from now. But the good news is you don't have to wait 10 years. Any person can put in a map. And um, James is going to share the mapping tool and there is a tutorial. So if you feel like you want to try your hand at this, you certainly can, and we will have district meetings to uh, present, you know, information to you so that the community will get a chance to input before a final plan is drawn up. I think that's it, James. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, wonderful. Um, so just to kind of capture what Commissioner Louis was saying there, there are these public hearings that are forthcoming and each district will be holding one. Um, so if you do live in district one, uh, that public hearing is next week, Thursday, uh, next week, Thursday evening at the Honoka, uh, Honoka Sports Complex, I believe. Um, and if uh, you would like to learn more information about this, uh, we did post up on the Waimea Community Association website some information about redistricting, as well as the state reapportionment effort too. So there's the county redistricting going on, and then there's also the state reapportionment happening too. So those are happening at the same time. They're doing different things. Uh, they have different deadlines, uh, but both deadlines are basically at the end of the year here. So the commissions are both working on these plans and are requesting input from the community and as well as submitting maps of your own making too. Um, so if you visit the Waimea Community Association website, there is an opportunity up on there under redistricting uh, community efforts, I believe, uh, it has links both to the county uh, commission and the state commission and as, as well as access to the online platform to uh, create maps, as well as the tutorial videos to learn about those systems. Um, so I wanna thank Commissioner Louis for joining us this evening to really highlight this effort and uh, update the community on this ongoing process. Mahalo, Mahalo Commissioner, thank you. Thanks for having me.
Absolutely. Good to see you. Uh, wonderful. Uh, at this time, um, I would like to welcome back uh, Captain Evangelista and our community policing officers, Justin Cabantin and Chandler Nacino, to share with us a few updates. Uh, welcome, officers. Thanks for joining us. Hey, James. All right. Thank you again for having us. I'll try to be quick. Um, a couple of announcements real quick. The, I'm not sure if you're aware, but the Hulu signs went up at the evacuation route. So that's all in our newsletter that was just sent out yesterday for those of you that get it. Um, if not, drop your email in the chat and I'll make sure you get a copy. Um, there's also um, announcements of the next coffee with a cop, um, some Halloween tips, and of course, um, domestic violence and um, breast cancer awareness for the month of October. So, but I'll go ahead and start off with the traffic stats. Um, so for the month of September, our South Kuala police officers were able to issue 962 citations. Uh, majority of it was in speeding, 234 in speeding, 171 in moving, 48 seat belts, along with seven child restraints, uh, 306 regulatory citations, 91 unsafes, 84 mobile electronic devices, uh, people using their cell phones, and they were able to secure 12 DUI arrests. Uh, also for the month of September, there was a, a total of 34 uh, traffic grants conducted. Of course, 21, 21 of the grants were speeding. Four of them were distracted driving, five seatbelt grants, and uh, four DUI grants. For the month of September, there was 10 major traffic collisions in our district. <clears throat> with uh, no fatalities. Um, actually, more of the traffic, ca traffic collisions happen on the weekday, not on the weekends. Um, one of them was um, DUI related and actually none of, the, none of the traffic accidents involved any of the animals crossing the road on Waikoloa Road or on, on DKI. Um, as far as the other traffic um, stats, like I, like I mentioned, the mobile electronic devices went up. And I know 962 citation sounds high, but it, it reflects also on the drug cases that officers initiate while making the, while making the traffic stops. So um, our, our officers are out there enforcing the traffic laws and also um, catching other criminals doing other things as well. But I want to take up any more information. I know Officer Nacino has the crime stats. Good evening. Uh, Going to go over the crime stats for the month of September. We saw a reduction in uh, criminal property damage cases uh, by 50%, which uh, last month was relatively high. A lot of the criminal property damage cases that we we're seeing last month involved uh, a vandalism to vehicles and items that were just left out and about. So it was, it was good to see a 50% reduction in that. As far as assaults go, we had four that were reported, uh, the vast majority, uh, which involved some sort of uh, alcohol being used. Uh, two burglaries were reported. There were uh, 16 theft cases reported. Uh, it's unfortunate to announce this, but we've been speaking about this over the past, I'd say three months. Um, the scams have been a vast majority of the reported theft cases that we've been uh, having reported to us. And unfortunately, they accounted for the vast majority of the felony um, theft cases, which to become a felony for theft is anywhere over uh, $2,500. As far as the auto thefts go, we had one reported auto theft and there were six drug cases. Now, almost all of them were reported off of, or initiated off of uh, traffic stops, which Officer Kabanting uh, spoke of. The traffic stops aren't just a way of uh, punishment, they're a way of <laughs> a correction of action and a means to another end of uh, 
coming across drug violations as well. We uh, have had a lot of neighborhood watch success. And if you are interested in getting involved in that, reach out to us. Our uh, email will be in the chat and I'll turn it over to the captain. Aloha, everybody. Thanks, you guys. Um, one thing I wanted to tag on to what Officer Nasino just said about the neighborhood watch. Um, we had a pretty interesting call earlier in September. A neighbor called because they saw a suspicious vehicle at their other neighbor's house. Um, we weren't able to find the vehicle just then, but a few minutes later, that vehicle was spotted in another location across town and same situation. Well, this is a little bit different. The guy noticed these uh, suspicious guys on his ring camera. Um, the reason I mention it is because these neighborhood watches, they, they create the awareness that we need uh, because we can't be everywhere. So neighbors looking out for each other uh, in this case led to the arrest of two suspects in a stolen car that were trying to steal another car. And it, it, we would not have noticed that. It was neighbors that were looking out for each other that reported that. So our neighborhood watch program, we, we, we're trying to build it, build it bigger. The more uh, eyes and ears that we have out there, the more successful we can all be as a community in preventing crime and catching those responsible for crime. And I wanna thank everybody and the public for continuing to trust us and call us with information uh, please keep doing that. It helps us all succeed. Mahalo. Thank you, Captain. And of course, mahalo to the officers for your time. And appreciate the work you're doing in our community to support us. It's wonderful to see you on the call this evening. And wish you all the best. Mahalo. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Much. Good to see you. Appreciate it. Um, and next, I would like to really thank you, our viewers, uh, really for continuing to do your part and encouraging your family, your friends, your neighbors to prevent the spread of COVID-19. On a sad note, however, we have recently lost some well-loved community members um, and we'd like to express condolences on behalf of the community. Um, we are seeing uh, a downward trend at this time, hopefully a downward trend of our case count. And we'd like to welcome back uh, our Queens North White Community Hospital Emergency Room and ICU physician, Dr. Crystal Hammer to share with us a brief COVID update and provide us some uh, guidance going forward. Mahalo, Dr. Hammer, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me back. Um, I also wanted to thank all of you in the community for all of the hard work that you've done because we have seen the case numbers coming down. We've seen our hospitalizations rate coming down um, and we've seen people stepping up getting first time vaccinations. Um, so thank you all of you for everything you're doing to protect the community, to protect yourselves and your loved ones. Um, it makes a difference. Um, I just wanted to uh, put a reminder out there for those of you who um, do test positive for COVID or perhaps you are positive for COVID and you know that you've exposed a friend or a loved one or family member who has risk factors. Um, there is a monoclonal antibody clinic here that is um, still running. It's by appointment only. Um, I can provide the phone number or it can be listed in the, the, the notes, but you can either self-refer or have your primary care physician refer. Um, and it's for people who have less than 10 days of symptoms. They don't have oxygen requirements. It's not for children less than 12 or severely underweight, but people who have um, risk factors that would put them at higher risk for hospitalization or higher risk of, of death or dying. Um, that includes people with chronic kidney disease, heart disease, lung disease, obesity, which is just a BMI greater than 25, which is probably actually most of the community, <laughs> um, just statistically speaking. Um, and that can be enough of a risk factor. So that is an option for you, or if you happen to expose somebody, um, you can't use a resource that you don't know about. So we are also still ask, um, offering vaccinations. That's a walk-in clinic. It's behind where the ER is at North White Community Hospital. And that's Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and there's also booster options available. So that would be people in a high risk uh, profession, healthcare workers, community first responders, anybody who's having kind of um, 
continuous potential exposure to COVID patients or anyone with a high risk feature. And that'd be the same kind of people who fit under that monoclonal antibody infusion for prevention. So people with chronic heart disease and lung disease and diabetes and um, women who are pregnant. Uh, so the booster is now an option um, available. You might get a little sore and there are side effects of the vaccination. I just got one last week. It's not terrible. It's way better than the people that I see coming in with COVID symptoms. Um, and then last time we spoke, we were at least in the hospital system and statewide, we had less than a six day supply of oxygen for the entire state. And we had to cancel all of our elective surgeries because there just wasn't enough oxygen. Um, that situation has now been remedied through um, groups coming together, making medical grade oxygen instead of other gases that they had been making, increased trans transportation of oxygen from mainland, increased ships coming back and forth. So we're not in a crisis mode there. Um, and statewide, there's not any cancellation of, of elective surgeries procedures, things that need to happen, right? Some people have maybe a mass, they want biopsy, they're worried about cancer. Those were all, some of those things were being delayed because of that. So um, those are now available here and at the other hospitals statewide. Um, and then just a reminder for quarantine um, from the CDC recommendations. So if you are exposed to somebody, you know they have COVID and you are unvaccinated, the recommendation is for 14 days of quarantine not being in public or around other people. If you are vaccinated, the recommendation, you don't need to be quarantined, but you need to be tested three to five days after your exposure, right? If you get tested too soon, you may not have a positive test result yet. Um, so within three to five days, and you should still wear a mask um, indoors and in public for 14 days. And obviously if you develop symptoms, that, that's different Then you need testing and um, potentially a true kind of quarantine at home. If you are sick with COVID, you need to stay at home for a minimum 10 days from when your symptoms start. And you should not be going out in public if you're still having fevers or if you're still needing to take medication that could suppress a fever, like Tylenol or ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve, all of those medications, aspirin, could artificially lower your temperature. Um, and your symptoms need to be improving. So if they're not improving, you're not ready to go out and about yet. And those recommendations change. If you're immunocompromised, you may not clear the virus as quickly. And so you shouldn't be um, going out because you could be spreading it. Um, it also changes if you have severe illness. If you have severe symptoms of COVID, perhaps you are hospitalized, you require an oxygen therapy. Sometimes your ability to clear the virus also takes longer and you could be spreading it for longer. So those two groups um, will have a higher period of time of isolation. Um, we are still, unfortunately, are, are fairly high in terms of our test positivity rate. So we're testing 5.2%. That's still quite high, but it's significantly better than it was our, our last update. We were closer to 10%. So um, again, thank you all for, for um, wearing masks, for isolating when appropriate, for getting vaccinated. Um, but we can continue to do better, but we're definitely trending in the right direction. And our hospitals are not overwhelmed to the same capacity. So it's Thank you, Dr. Hammer. I appreciate you with those updates. Um, yes, please continue doing your part, um, as the doctor mentioned, uh, to prevent the spread of COVID-19, wearing your masks, practicing good physical distancing, and avoid large gatherings at this time. This is our Quiliana, and uh, we really owe it to our medical care professionals uh, for all the work that they're doing to support us during this time. Um, please also be considered vaccinated when the time is right for you. Um, it's really our part to, for the health and safety of the community and our loved ones. Uh, if you have any questions, I encourage you to visit hawaiicovid19.com, which is the state COVID-19 portal, or the county portal at hawaiicounty.gov slash coronavirus. And mahalo and thank you again, Dr. Hammer, to you and your colleagues for all the work that you're doing here in our community. Mahalo. Absolutely. Good to see you on. Wonderful. Um, for the month of October, uh, the Waimea Community Association will be spotlighting the West Waimea Mediation Center as our nonprofit of the month. And as we mentioned at our last meeting, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled an end to the um, eviction moratorium. And as such, um, mediation is now required to help landlords and tenants resolve any issues under Hawaii Act 57. 
uh, guidance and support is available. And we thought it pertinent to hear directly with those taking on this effort, uh, working with both tenants and landlords alike. Uh, so we're grateful to be joined uh, by the Landlord Mediation Coordinator at West Hawaii Mediation Center, Kate Sims, this evening to connect with the community. Uh, welcome, Kate. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, James, and thank you to the Waimea Community Association for spotlighting the West Hawaii uh, Mediation Center this month, and also for just support for the West Hawaii Mediation and Kuakahi as well, the Mediation Center, sister Mediation Center on the on the Hilo side, and the work that we're doing to uh, help solve problems through mediation rather than going to court. It's a great way to. Um, you know, to repair relationships and to move forward in a productive way. I'm gonna just quickly talk a little bit about Act 57, the result of Act 57, which was legislation that was passed this year. It was a one year, as a one year term. Um, it's a an act that focuses on what we were gonna, well, basically the state was trying to take care of what they were going to do when the moratorium, the COVID moratorium ended, the renting, uh, sorry, the um, eviction moratorium ended. They were concerned that they may end up with a, a slew of cases all of a sudden coming through the courts because people were behind in paying their rent if they had been out of work. And so Act 57 is a way to sort of manage that. So I'm going to quickly um, share screen. I'm, I, I'm going to try to be quick, but I'm nervous about your one, you know, you, you showing that one minute. <laughs> I'm going to get nervous about that, but let me quickly um, just say, so the, the, what Act 57 is, is the Landlord Tenant Eviction Mediation Program, and it was launched on August 6th. There was some confusion at the time because the CDC extended the moratorium until the 6th of August, October, but um, the Supreme Court knocked that down and we're back to the 6th of August being the final end of the moratorium. So quite a few people who had been unable to pay their rent, um, their, their landlords began the process of trying to evict them. This, the what Act 57 does is it um, states that tenants can be offered the opportunity for mediation when they are served with an eviction notice for non-payment. I might just to clarify something that you said, James, it's not mandatory, it is optional. And it's optional based on what the tenant wants and needs. If the, if the landlord wants it, and often we find that the landlords want it even more than, the, than the, the tenants, they also, you know, landlords don't wanna go to court and they don't wanna force people out, but they wanna have a, a solution to sometimes a very difficult situation. And so, um, but it's on the, it's, it's not the landlord who gets to make the call, it's the tenant. Um, when landlords provide notice, that, now, so there's a notice that you can find online for, and you can find it on both of the websites, ours and, and Helos as well. Um, there's a notice, sort of a, a, a fill, form fillable notice that landlords can use to provide the tenants a 15 day notice that they are going to evict for lack of payment. At that time, the landlords are required to send that notice into one of the mediation centers, depending on where the um, rental is. If it's on West Hawaii, it'll come to me as the case manager in West Hawaii. At that stage, I will get in touch with, I will send documentation to the landlord that, that we've received this and also will send documentation to the tenant, letting them know about their options for mediation. Um, the process then, um, I do an intake for, for um, and I talk to both the tenants and the landlords, I get sort of a sense of what's going on, how long it's been since payment has happened, what the situation is for the tenant. I give them the sense of, you know, try to you know, point out to them that mediation could be helpful to them to keep them from being evicted. And also you know, to keep landlords from going to court, they're just as eager for that as, as the tenants are often eager to talk with their talk with their landlords in a way that helps them find a way forward without getting evicted. Once people get evicted, um, that notice on a, on a, on a uh, credit record can make it almost impossible to find another place to live. And it's especially difficult because we're so tight on rental properties right now anyway. So we, we want to see if we can avoid that mark on people's um, record by moving forward in a positive way with the landlords. Um, if needed, we will provide language interpreters or make other accommodations. We schedule normally during the workday, eight to four, Monday through Friday. But if people, for example, as has happened a lot, if tenants have just been reemployed and they have a new job, 
and they can't come during a regular work day, then we work after, after hours or on the weekend if need be. All of our mediations right now are taking place on Zoom unless the, the client has no capacity to meet online. Okay, um, I can I, okay. Um, just uh, quickly that um, if the tenant decides that they do not want to mediate within that 15 days, if we haven't scheduled the mediation within that 15 days, they haven't called me back or they, you know, they haven't emailed me and let me know that they're interested, the, the landlord can go ahead and move ahead and, and have um, towards eviction. And if it, if let's say they, they schedule one, but in that first 15 days, but then don't show up for a mediation, again, if it's within it's in a 30 day period and we can't reschedule because they haven't got back to us, again, the landlord is able to file for eviction. Um, there's a lot of um, lot that people don't know about this program. And I'm really hoping that you will help disseminate information that it exists and it can be a really good positive. Uh, every one of the cases, with the exception of one, every single one of the cases that we've mediated has come to an agreement outside of court, which is a super positive thing for people in the community. Um, and we wanna keep that going. We want people to, to know about our program and access it. Um, I think, you know, I'll stop there, but I will ask if people have questions to let me know. Um, we would be more than happy to fill you in on any information around this program. Thank you so much, Kate. I, I apologize for the short window there, um, but it's great to have you on and I appreciate your clarification on these things and all the work that you're doing for the sake of the community. Um, it's really great work that you're doing and uh, appreciate all that, you, all that you've done and uh, continue to do. So thank you. Thank you. And, and if you are interested in supporting the work of the West Y Mediation Center, as they continue to support our friends and our families during this time, uh, donations can be made directly to West Y Mediation Center. Uh, we have also established a donation link and button up on the front page of the WCA uh, website, excuse me. Uh, and we'll maintain this button and method of donating towards this cause for the month of October. And these targeted donations collected in this month will be bundled and transferred uh, to West Y Mediation Center. We are grateful for your generosity th during this time to support uh, nonprofits in the community such as West Y Mediation Center. Mahalo. Uh, next up, uh, we'll be hearing from our county council member from District 1, uh, and I'd like to welcome on Councillor Heather Kimball to share with us some news and some updates from the county council. Welcome, Councillor. Hi, James. Thank you, as always, to the Waimea Community Association for the invitation to um, talk to you folks tonight. I'm, I'm actually calling from my office tonight. In the past, I've called from home, so welcome to my office. Uh, I, I look forward to the day where I can actually have people um, come here and visit in person. Uh, there were three things that I wanted to cover tonight. One is uh, trailers at the waste transfer station, the bridge situation in Hamakua, which I know uh, uh, impacts you guys to a certain extent. And then um, finally, the, the TAT uh, tax bill for um, the county. Um, so first of all, we had a presentation last week or this week um, from Ramsey Mansour, the director of environmental management for the county. And as you folks know, um, he uh, decided to enforce, or the administration decided to enforce the rule that has always on the, been on the books that trailers um, are not allowed at the transfer stations. Um, he, due to public feedback for the desire to have that ability to take trailers into the transfer stations, um, the Department of Environmental Management has identified five locations where with minimal cost to the county, we may be able to allow trailers back in. And one of those is the, the transfer station in Waimea. So just so you folks know, timing wise, we're probably about three months out from that. Um, there's, there's some painting and striping and things that are gonna need to happen, but there also has to be a rules change. So the rule has been no trailers. Um, that process does require a 30 day period for comment, public comment. And so um, our, our um, Corp Council will be putting together the rule. We'll have the, we'll agendize it and put it out for public comment and then go from there. So just a rough estimate about three months before that capacity is brought back to the Waimea transfer station. Um, as you know, Kole Kole Bridge uh, was closed on September 21st for traffic um, more than four tons, which is really anything other than a passenger vehicle or small truck. 
Um, fortunately, the state DOT was able to, within a few days, um, address some of the problems with the bridge and, and increase the weight limit up to um, 12 tons. And so that's where we are right now, and that's where we'll remain for some time with some regulation of traffic across that bridge. They expect to, with the availability, availability of materials, to open it fully um, by the end of the year. But this has um, brought to light the, the necessity to address all of these bridges on the Hamakua Coast that are um, definitely been part of the, the, the county for a while and are all facing the same sorts of problems. So I had a great conversation with um, the state director, um, deputy director Ed Sniffen about the, the bridges um, earlier this week. And this, the plan is this, in um, 2023, they'll be doing Hakalau, then they will do um, Nanui and, uh, 2024, Wailuku 2025 or the Singing Bridge, and then they will come back to Kole Kole in 2026. All told, these bridges, it's, it's about $120 million investment in infrastructure upgrades for the Hamakua Coast. The good news for you folks up in Waimea, I know that you had all of these people having to come through your town to get over to Hilo. Um, none of these will be closed fully during the repairs. The state will use a combination of one-way traffic and temporary bridges to make sure that there still continues to be flow um, on the Hamakua coast, although we may see some weight restrictions as time goes on. So pretty excited to have that investment in the coast. And I want to mahalo Council Member Richards, um, Senator Inouye, and, and Representative Mark Nakashima, who all contributed to, to making sure that the DOT sees this as a priority. And, and hopefully that infrastructure package will pass at the federal level and we'll get some money for that as well. And then just finally, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the county TAT bill. Last legislative session, the state legislature uh, put forth an act that discontinued the portion of the TAT that was distributed to the counties from the TAT that was collected by the state. For us, that's about $20 million. Um, so we are no longer getting that from the state. What they did do is let us raise the taxes. We were able to raise uh, our own county level TAT at 3%. And so that um, my office just introduced this uh, earlier this week so that we can have that discussion. The first hearing on it will be on October 19th. Um, I, I'm not, I don't relish doing this. And in fact, I testified against removing the state allocation when it was at the state legislature, but I don't see how we close that $20 million hole any other way. Um, so if you would like to testify again, October 19th is the first hearing in the finance committee. We certainly welcome public comment on this pretty critical piece of legislation. And with that, that's my update. Thank you, James, and happy to ask questions later on in the, the meeting. Thank you, Councillor. And as you can see, you know, we have a lot of people on tonight's call and really appreciate all the time that they're giving. Um, there's a lot to really go into. We could spend the whole meeting with each of them to really talk about these different topics. Uh, grateful for them to just give a little bit of their time here to give you some updates. Uh, and of course, if you have other interests and questions, I, I recommend you reach out to these individuals and these organizations to really uh, ask some of those harder questions you might have. Um, so thank you, Councillor, and thank you everyone that's presented thus far. Um, you know, uh, next up we have a couple of other smaller community updates and events that are happening in the community. And first up, I would like to welcome uh, Tammy Muranaka to let us know about a community-wide event that's uh, kicking off tomorrow. Uh, so welcome, Tammy. I'll make sure you're unmuted there. There we go. Wonderful. Thank welcome. you. Thank you so much, James. Um, aloha, everyone. My name is Tammy Muranaka. I am an education assistant at Waime Elementary. I am also a three-time breast cancer survivor. Um, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And for several years, I've done a Pink It Up project at Waime Elementary with the staff and the students, where they all dress up in pink to support me and all breast cancer survivors. The staff and students get really excited for this event every year because they feel my passion they make a connection and they learn to care for others. This year, it is happening tomorrow on Friday, October 8th. Participation is simple. We're asking everyone to wear pink. 
I would like to encourage the Waimea community to be part of my project and Pink It Up Waimea. The last two years have made it hard to have events due to COVID. This would be something to bring the community together because I know of several people who live in Waimea that are battling breast cancer right now or may have lost their battle. Besides Waimea Elementary, Waimea Middle School, Thelma Parker Library, Honoka'a High School, Canada France Hawaii Telescope, Keck, and more than 20 Waimea businesses are participating in this year's Pink It Up Day. So let's pink it up, Waimea. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tammy. Um, that's, that's fantastic. And um, look forward to joining in with everyone else in the community tomorrow. Should be pretty fun to see everyone across town wearing pink. So definitely encourage that. <laughs> Thank you so much for putting this on, Tammy, really kicking this off. Um, wonderful, good to see you. Uh, next up, we have one of our own board members to share another upcoming event in the community. I would like to welcome on uh, Mary Beth Lechek to share about some news. Welcome, Mary Beth. Hi, thank you, James. Today I am talking with my Canada France Y telescope hat on. We at CFHT have partnered with the um, Keck Observatory on a new Hawaii science walk. So some of you may remember um, back in March, we did a planet walk, a solar system walk. We used along the bypass road. We had planets set up at their appropriate distances in the solar system and there were decals and you could watch videos. This time we've decided to take it to science. This was in celebration of the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, we were supposed to have a culminating event at the end of the month that we canceled um, for later. But starting in late October and running through November, we're going to have a science walk. So as you walk along the bypass road, you will see decals on the side of the road that connect you to links that talk about all of the science that's done on the Big Island. We have participation from the Hawaii Wildlife Center, who is gonna be talking about native bird conservation, the Alala project, which is talking about their efforts um, with the native Hawaiian crow, volcano observatory, the um, national marine sanctuary with a really beautiful humpback whale video, NOAA talking about the earth's atmosphere, the um, Daniel Kanoe Telescope on Maui, which is a solar telescope and looks at the sun, um, the University of Hawaii Institute for Astronomy, they're talking about exoplanets, and um, the Keck Telescope, talking about the James Webb Space Telescope. What links all of these is the idea that this new space telescope, JWST, is going to look for life, the symbols, the biomarkers of life on other planets. And what they're looking for are all of the little pieces of science that we do here on the Big Island. And so the observatories um, on Mauna Kea are going to collaborate with JWST, um, and we wanted to really celebrate this launch. So we encourage everybody to go walk the bypass road. Um, I know when we had the solar system walk up, a lot of the runners commented when I was taking it down how nice it was to count their miles in the solar system. This time you can, you know, count your distance from Waimea. We're starting very close to home and then going all the way through to um, space. So thank you so much. And um, we hope to see you out on the bypass road. Thanks, Mary Beth. How exciting, wonderful news there. Um, so those are a couple of uh, upcoming community events that are happening. I uh, just want to take a moment to share some other uh, information and news and some other community announcements. You know, it was only um, kind of on a, a little sad note here, it was only about two months ago that we experienced the traumatic event that led to the loss of family homes, displaced, displaced family members, and even our animals, and placed a great deal of strain on our emergency services. Uh, we continue to be grateful for all of the first responders and community members that stood together to face down that challenge. And it was shortly after that Heron Week, Week Plus, that the WCA reached out to one of our past meeting presenters to learn of the status and the impact of their project, to their particular project. And as, as you're aware of the path of the fire, uh, we were curious to hear from Interjects uh, about, the, about the, you know, their update to the community on their Hale, Hale Kuavehi project. Uh, we, will we will post their full correspondence that we've had with them up on our website and Facebook page. But I just wanted to share 
uh, just a brief excerpt from, from their letter they sent to us. Um, Aloha Waimea Community Association members. We hope this communication finds you well and healthy. Uh, we'd like to thank the Waimea Community Association for giving us the opportunity to provide an update on the progress of the Hale Kuavehi Solar Project. It has been a few months since our last update. Uh, and during the summer, sadly, a raging brush fire impacted thousands of acres, including uh, burning through about half of our half of the Hale Kuavehi solar site. Uh, thankfully, we have only reported grass and vegetation loss. In addition, the project did lose two data monitoring sites on Parker Ranch property. Uh, but we want to join the Waimea Community Association in recognizing and thanking the first responders who tirelessly faced the largest wildfire ever recorded on Hawaii Island. So thank you, um, Miriam and uh, Interjects for this letter and correspondence, and we will post the, the full um, letter up on our uh, website and Facebook page so everyone can view that and some of the information about that and how they can learn more about the project too. So thank you for that there. Um, looking ahead, uh, November is, I'm gonna post up uh, something here on the screen. Uh, let's see. So November is the return of the humpback whale month. So something else to look forward to. Um, this up on your screen there is the November calendar of events from the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, if you're interested in learning about some of these amazing, these, especially these amazing creatures, there really are a number of opportunities to participate and discover and expand your horizons about these creatures. Uh, so a number of different ev events happening in the community. Most of those are seem to be uh, virtual events and webinars that you can participate in. Uh, there are also some posters you're able to pick up at the Waimea uh, Thelma Park Memorial Library. So those are there to uh, first come, kind of first serve. I think if you want to decorate your classroom or so forth, that's an opportunity to do so. So something fun to look forward to uh, the months ahead. And then another thing we will be touching on for on our side for WCA and the month of November. Um, you know, last our last announcement uh, is really about our November town meeting and really kind of our last full meeting of the year. Um, and you know, I'd like to thank, first of all, thank our one of our board members, Nancy Carr Smith, for taking up the responsibility of organizing and directing our annual effort in November of expressing the community's gratitude for our first responders. And I just wanted to share a few notes and words from Nancy, um, and then also share some information about the meeting that's upcoming here. So I'll put this up on the screen so you can see that. Just something to look forward to in November here. So this is our annual uh, Mahalo to our first responders in the community. Um, this is our fifth annual Mahalo. And uh, we're gonna be selling kind of, uh, you know, our, our normal town meeting, but we've pushed it to November 18th, a little bit closer to the Thanksgiving holiday there. Um, and this year is especially important to us in the community that we provide a, a proper thank you to our courageous neighbors, mostly due to the wildfires that affected our community recently. Uh, and this is all from Nancy Carr Smith here. So last year and this year, since we cannot meet in person, we will focus on donations from the community in the form of either cash or gift cards to local grocery stores or restaurants that do takeout. The firefighters get a small amount of money to go toward their daily food allowances. So this will help keep them fed and nourished, which is in our opinion, the best way that we can show them care and that we care about them. Uh, we encourage our schools in the community and organizations to write general mahalo cards that can be shared with the with our fire uh, fire station, police station, and with the hospital. Uh, with COVID, we are discouraging home baked goods coming through us, but pre bought pre packaged goodies from local stores can be accepted. Thanks for your understanding on that. Um, also, wanted to mention that there is a county fire department wish list that we will be sharing with you, which we will also keep posted up on our our website and our Facebook page. So if there's anything that you would like to donate towards or with uh, your, your business or your organization, uh, we can help make that easy for you and see that list of asks that our, our county police, uh, sorry, county fire department is, is looking forward to. Um, and as we spoke with uh, him last time, Battalion Chief uh, Bill Bergen asked us really to focus on our volunteer firefighters. You know, we, we, he always says this to us about that they get paid to do the work that they're doing, but the volunteer crews are really the ones that are leaving their families and their other jobs to come up and help when we need them. And they're really the ones making things work uh, and function together. Um, so that's always something that 
uh, Chief Bergen always mentions about the volunteer crews. Uh, we'll be giving our thanks to the, the first couple of weeks through November, and then we'll share it with all of you folks in this sort of fashion or virtual setting with the entire community on November 18th. Um, if you'd like to donate or if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to Nancy. Um, her number should be up on that flyer. It is 896-2239, or you can email Nancy or her husband, Riley, at the email, email address up on the flyer there. Uh, you can also find more information on our website at whitemanatown.org. Uh, so really want to thank all of you, the community, for supporting our first responders uh, during this time and contributing in this in this light for our, our first responders Mahalo kind of uh, function in November. So thank you very much. So those are a couple of uh, number of announcements from the community here and uh, really wanted to move into our, our final portion of the, the meeting tonight. And I, I appreciate the patience of our of our speakers so far, uh, waiting to the end of the meeting here. Um, really, for the end of this meeting, we are grateful to be joined by a number of guests to enlighten us about the water of Waimea. Uh, we will be hearing about critical infrastructure projects, watershed protection work, and education initiatives, and even a look at future possibilities. You know, as we think about the importance of our water for this next portion of what makes Waimea unique. Uh, I would like to provide some background information on our Waimea water infrastructure. And I would like to thank one of our WCA board members, David Greenwell, with his experience in the field for this information. So this is kind of something for us to learn about and, and learn a little bit to know about our water systems here in Waimea. Uh, we have here in Waimea, we have two separate water systems. The potable or domestic water system is managed and operated by the County of Hawaii through the Department of Water Supply and provides the water customers get to supply their homes. The state of Hawaii through the Department of Agriculture manages and operates the irrigation system that services farmers and the Department of Hawaiian Homelands agricultural lots. Both of these systems draw their water from the Kohala Mountains, but from different sources. The County Department of Water Supply system goes through a purification treatment plant where the state irrigation system is raw water directly from the mountains. Uh, they are never allowed to be mixed or plumbed together. The county system is much longer and more extensive and the state system uses larger pipes but is very limited to primarily the agricultural lands of Waimea. Both of these systems use water storage reservoirs to hold water, especially during times of low rainfall. Uh, the pricing structure of both systems are based on thousands of gallons of water uh, being used by customers. The county system incorporates a tier system based on the amount of usage and the state system has a, their system where they have a standby charge and charge additionally by acres being utilized for agriculture. The county system also has two wells that can be utilized during dry periods or as needed. Uh, then the state system has a has the pu'u uh, Pulehu or Lakeland Reservoir, which uh, is a 120 million gallon reservoir for backup. And as stated earlier, both systems are totally separate uh, and they will stay that way for distribution to the customers. Uh, we are fortunate for that both systems operate uh, here in Waimea, that we have offices here in Waimea. Uh, we have functioning crews and operating crews in the Waimea area. So that's just some background on our Waimea systems, particularly with the infrastructure side of it and really to explore the county system and provide us some updates on current and forthcoming projects. Uh, I would like to welcome the Department of Water Supply Manager and Chief Engineer, Keith Okamoto. Welcome Keith, thanks for joining us this evening. Hey, thanks James, I, uh, you did my whole presentation for me. So any questions from anybody at, at this point? <laughs> nah. Well, I, I do have a couple of uh, additional information to share. So I'll, let me share my screen. Alrighty, can you guys see that? The weird part on Zoom is that you don't see what you're sharing, right? So anyway, so here we go. Um, so yeah, thanks James and uh, the association for this opportunity. You guys always have terrific, terrific information uh, at your community meetings. And this one actually was uh, amazing. All the information, various information that was on the agenda tonight. Um, so anyway, uh, 
see if I can get this PowerPoint to work. Um, but here's our mission statement and our model. So our mission statement is to provide customers with an adequate and continuous supply of safe drinking water in a financially responsible manner, comply with all relevant standards and assist and facilitate development of water systems in areas not currently served. And our motto is water, our most precious resource, Kavaya Kane. Um, basically our mission is, you know, if you're on our system anyway, hopefully uh, a lot of you are, if you open your tap, water's supposed to come out. Water comes out, you can fill it in a glass, drink it, you're not going to get sick or die, right? And then uh, lastly, when you get your water bill, it's hopefully cheaper than your electric bill, your gas bill, your cable bill, your cell bill, and, and all those other uh, monthly bills that we typically have. So basically, that's our mission. Uh, clean water, keep it flowing, minimize disruptions, and uh, make sure it's safe to drink, yeah? Alrighty, here is a, a map of the water systems around the island. Uh, James did a terrific job of describing our Waimea system. So if you can kind of see where my arrow is moving, our Waimea base yard serves this area. So Waimea and then to the east, uh, down towards Hamakua, all the way down to Lapahoihoi uh, area and towards Waipio Valley, Kukui Haile area. Uh, and then also down to the resort areas of Mauna Kea Beach, Hapuna, Maunalani, and the um, uh, Kauai High Harbor area. We also have systems in the Havi and Kapa'au areas and the Makapala areas that our Waimea crew um, operates and maintains. Large geographic area. Uh, we have about 160 total personnel uh, on island. And I believe about 26 of them are in the Waimea base yard. So some additional background on the Department of Water Supply. We manage actually 23 separate uh, water systems that are uh, basically overseen by the State Department of Health Safe Drinking Water Branch. We have about 45,000 accounts, which services roughly 120,000 of our island's population. Uh, we have about over 1,200 miles of pipe, over 70 sources, which includes wells, springs, and some surface sources in Waimea, and we have over 200 water storage tanks. Our current operating budget is just under 55 mil, which is actually a 1% uh, decrease from previous years. And just so uh, everybody understands, is we don't uh, get any revenues from your real property tax. All our revenues come from our ratepayers and our customers. Um, so that's where we differ uh, from other county departments. All right, just real quickly, I'm gonna kind of breeze through some of um, standard infrastructure. Here's a picture of a, a well um, components. Uh, yeah. Here's a typical storage tank that stores the water. Here's the inside of a tank. And our tanks, our newer tanks now are designed with the seismic reinforcing. As we know, our island is home to a frequent number of earthquakes and different areas of the island actually have different earthquake hazard categories. So we design our tanks accordingly and uh, they've done very well. Matter of fact, uh, we had the big one back in 2006 and most of our, well, all of our, our new water tanks uh, did terrific uh, during that event. Here's what a, a water main looks like. Typically, most people don't, don't see this because they are either driving over it or walking over it, and it's buried typically underground, out of sight. Here's what a booster station looks like. Here's what a water meter re, uh, looks like. And this is basically our source of revenue. Uh, tip, you know, typically, our, our meter readers for a residential type meter will, will read it every two months. So your typical water bill is for a two month period. Um, and fortunately, our, you know, we try to keep the rates reasonable so we can keep it at a two month uh, interval at this point in time. Alrighty, here is some of the com recently completed projects that we have done in the past five years. And if you notice, uh, the, the projects are spread throughout the island with three notable ones in the Waimea, Waimea uh, district area. Um, one of the big ones is up at our Waimea treatment plant. For us, that was a very large project uh, 
close to $12 million. And that upgraded our water treatment plant from a conventional, which is a media filtration to membrane filtration, um, ultra, you know, ultra filtration, um, fine fibers that, that filter the water basically. So total um, within the last five years, we've invested about $45 million in capital improvements across the island. And these included wells, treatment plant upgrades that I just mentioned, uh, new tanks, as well as uh, pipeline replacement. Projects that we currently have under, uh, under construction, we have another major project up in the Halaula area in North Kohala. This is a new water well storage tank, transmission water lines and supporting facilities. Uh, and that one is under construction right now. Um, should be done within an uh, about six months from now. Uh, we're still waiting on uh, power utility to install some of the power poles uh, to our well site, as well as uh, some permitting issues with the state. Let's see, we also have uh, a well project in Kona and a couple projects in the uh, Hilo area under construction. All right, and in the pipeline, in the planning and design phase, we have about $33 million worth of projects in planning and design. Um, as you can see uh, around the island as well, but if you notice, there are actually three in the Waimea service area. One big one that I, I do wanna um, mention is a Lalamilo 10 million gallon storage reservoir. And as we uh, all know, uh, you know, energy uh, is, is a big deal for both the island and the state, you know, uh, turning to renewable energy. So we, we have a contract with a wind farm in the area, which could really benefit from additional storage. So there's different types of energy storage, as you know, there's batteries, which are what most people are uh, used to hearing about. But for us in the water business, you know, we're not experts at maintaining or, or operating battery energy storage units, but we can make use of a big water tank. And a big water tank is another form of energy storage. And basically what that allows is when the wind is blowing, it allows the tank to fill up. Uh, when the wind stops blowing, that water in that tank now can go and feed our system. So uh, we're really looking forward to that project. I really wanna uh, give a uh, thanks to Senator Lorraine Inouye who helped us uh, secure state funding for this, uh, which is huge for us. Uh, normally we don't, we don't get state funding. So um, she really went to bat for us on this one. And um, we're partnered with uh, Parker Ranch on this. Um, so they're always a great collaborator and we are planning to construct this tank on Parker Ranch property. Um, it will be, a, a, I think, you know, at the end of the day, once it's done, it'll be um, just a terrific uh, project, not only for the Department of Water Supply, but for the County of Hawaii and our goals of um, making better use of renewable energies. All righty, and with that, I'm done, James. Um, and I believe we'll handle questions later at the end. If you don't mind, Keith, we'll uh, we'll jump to some questions after some of our other water presenters, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure thing. All righty, thanks, guys. Thanks. Appreciate it. Mahalo, Keith. Um, all right, so really, to you know, as we consider, we've heard from about some infrastructure from uh, Keith Okamoto on from DWS and really to consider the source of our water, especially in the Waimea area, and the reliance we have on our native Kohala rainforest, um, I would like to welcome in from the Kohala Center to, to share with us their knowledge and ongoing work uh, and projects in the field to preserve our sense of place. So joining us this evening, we have uh, Liam Kernell, the Director of Community Experience, Jake Merkel, Kohala Watershed Field Supervisor, and Mahina Patterson, INA-based Education Specialist, and Eke Project Manager. Welcome, Liam, Jake, and Mahina. I'll pass it over to you.
How are we doing there? I'll just make sure you're unmuted. Uh, Liam, did you need to be? You have first, Liam. Sorry, I always no do problem. that. No, uh, it's all good. <laughs> thanks for joining us. Everybody can see this. Can you can you see the slides? All good. Yes, please go right okay, ahead. You want awesome. Okay, mahalo. Uh, aloha ahi ahi kako. Um, I want to mahalo the Waimea Community Association for inviting us to be a part of this conversation about Vai. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the Kohala Center in just a moment, but uh, I do want to say up front that every day we work to turn ancestral knowledge and research into action. So I want to open with a question that's drawn from a source of ancestral knowledge that inspires us in our efforts related to Vai. Um, there's an oli, it's called Himele no Kane. And a single question in this oli is repeatedly asked. And that question is, aya ihea kawai akane, or where is the water of kane? The akua kane is associated with fresh water uh, as well as light and purity. Um, and this oli calls upon all of us to seek knowledge about water and all of the places it comes from. Uh, I do, I wanna say that yeah, regardless of our individual ancestries, uh, I can pretty much guarantee that folks way back in our lineages knew their sources of water because it was literally essential for their continued survival. Uh, but today, many of us take for granted um, that Vai is always there. It's always at the faucet uh, or at the spigot whenever we need it. Uh, and those of us on County Water can mahalo Keith and his team for that. Um, so this question inspires us to strengthen our relationships with Vai. But before we can do that, we need to know the true sources of our Vai. So I'm gonna ask everyone watching and listening uh, to this meeting to comment um, either here on Zoom or on Facebook, uh, your answer to this question. Where does your water come from? So I know the Facebook feed is a little bit laggy. Um, actually, now I can't see the chat. <laughs> so um, Mahina, maybe. Oh, there's the chat right there. So I'm going to ask everybody on the call, too, to say, you know, where is where is your water come from? And I'm going to check the uh, Facebook feeds as well. Um, don't be shy, but I'm going to give you a hint. It, I'm talking about before the water supply, before the Department of Water Supply. Where does your bite come from? Kakiakua, the faucet. <laughs> All right, Keith. <laughs> Simmer down. The ocean, the Forest, Mahalo Heather. I'm gonna just I'm gonna spoil this right now and just say ding ding ding. Heather's correct. It comes from the forest. It comes from the cloud forest. Um, and in Hawaii, you know, we often say that our our vai comes from our mountains because that's where our, our cloud forests are, right? So if you ask somebody, if you ask any of us at the Kohala Center where our vai comes from, we're pretty much gonna say Kohala Mountain or Mauna Kea or uh, Hualalai. Um, and Yisha on the wind. And yes, that is also correct to a point as well. So. Um, mahalo everyone uh, for chiming in on that. Um, now, for those of you who might be meeting us for the first time, uh, the Kohala Center is an independent research, education, and minus stewardship nonprofit for healthier ecosystems. Uh, for 21 years, we've been turning ancestral knowledge and research into action to improve the conditions that lead to stronger relationships with our place, water, food, and people. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Kohala Center uh, is focused on creating and maintaining conditions that foster healthier ecosystems. And there are four distinct yet inter inter interrelated um, island ecosystems that we work in primarily. We work in the coral reefs, particularly the Dahipan of Kahalaube. We work in the Ahupua of Kauai Hai on the leeward side of Kohala Mountain. We work in the Kula agro ecosystems across Hawaii um, that support the working lands and people who grow and produce our local food. And in the cloud forest ecosystem of Kohala Mountain, which for many of us in North Hawaii is our source of life. Um, in each of these ecosystems that we work in, our efforts are guided by a primary question. And for our cloud forest efforts, um, that question is, the question that drives our work is, um, how do we bring more water down Kohala Mountain in a Pono way? So um, my job is done here. And I guess I got the easy part because all I'm doing is asking questions. Um, but at this point, I'm gonna introduce uh, Jake Merkel, uh, who is our Kohala Watershed Field Supervisor. And he's gonna share a little bit about uh, cloud forests, our efforts to preserve and propagate Kohala's cloud forest and how these efforts are helping answer our driving question. Jake. Mahalo Liam and James for the introduction. Um, Aloha kakou. Um, 
So I'll be giving a very brief look into the preservation of the koala cloud forest. Um, I just want to say that my Ohana and I both drink from the water of the koala cloud forest, and I'm very lucky to be uh, a community member in Waimea. Um, Liam's uh, going to be operating our slideshow. So Liam, uh, next slide, please. So first, um, I just like to kind of ask uh, the question, you know, why is it called a cloud forest? And, uh, and try to answer that um, to the best scientific knowledge that we have um, and ancestral knowledge. Um, obviously, uh, some of this, you know, might be obvious to some people, um, but I'm not sure. So first, um, it's called a cloud forest because it has persistent low level cloud cover. Um, and it's different from high level cloud cover that we see here in the islands nearly everywhere on the island at some point in time. Um, the Kohala cloud forest uh, is common to have much more cloud cover and rain isn't as common. Um, there is rainfall there often, but not as often as something like fog drip coming from cloud cover. Um, it's estimated that two thirds of the water captured on Kohala mountain is through fog drip and um, the other third is from rainfall. Uh, and another thing that's important is uh, the species in a cloud forest have adapted to that place and helped capture um, the, the fog drip and the cloud cover um, that's releasing that moisture. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide is basically just a map of Kohala and um, it's depicting some rainfall gradient. Uh, as you can see in that smallest circle near the top of Koala Summit, uh, it's estimated that about 160 inches fall annually in rainfall and in um, fog drip. And near Kauai High, it's much, much less than that. Um, so we'll be focusing in on the upper section of the mountain. Uh, next slide, please. So it's basically a very similar slide to the last one, but we're taking the two uh, rainfall contours there towards the top of um, the forest line, of, uh, sorry, towards the bottom of the forest line of Kuala Mountain. Um, so we're focusing in to that zone and that inner contour line, um, which is everything inside of that contour line is estimated to be about 140 inches of rainfall per year. Um, that's where the bulk of Koala's cloud forest still remains. There are fragmented, fragmented sections outside of that um, to the outermost contour line that you can see. Um, on this map, you can also see the many um, intermittent and perennial streams that we have uh, on that section of our island. And just to think of what I said before, two thirds of that is coming from uh, fog drip from within those two contour lines. It's, it's pretty amazing that we get that amount of water flow on the windward side of Koala Mountain. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I always contemplate, you know, and think of all the things that make a cloud forest special, and it's really endless. Um, it's absolutely infinite. I, I'm always blown away. And I'm just going to mention here a few things that are special of the cloud forest. Um, it's almost magical to me, but sometimes I'm simple minded. Um, so, moist air from the ocean trade winds basically blows up from uh, the Northeast. And as that air moves up, it condenses and it creates clouds. Um, we also get clouds forming in different ways, but that's one of the most consistent ways that clouds form on our Northeast slopes and come over the top of our Koala Mountain. Um, those, those tiny water droplets accumulate on organisms um, like lehua blossoms, like you see the, in the image on the left side of the screen on the bottom. Um, that's, that's water accumulating from droplets that are so small that you can't, really even see them blowing through the wind in front of you, but somehow these organisms just collected. It's amazing. It happens right in front of your eyes. It's magic. Um, uh, those forest organisms collectively act as like a giant sponge. 
Um, that's the best way that I can describe it. It's this massive sponge in the forest in the clouds. Um, and as you can see, my, my hand, uh, hand drawn little sketch on the bottom kind of depicts what I was talking about. Um, next slide, please. So uh, talking about what does the Kohala Cloud Course do for us on, on, our, on our island, um, talking about ecosystem services of our cloud forest. Um, and these are just some of them. Um, it attracts and retains moisture in the form of clouds, um, fogs, and rain. Uh, our cloud forest releases water slowly, which is very important. Um, it doesn't just run off the field systems and run off barren land. It, it collects in the forest and it slows down. It enters the aquifer slowly. Um, it enters streams and releases slowly. Um, it provides fresh water, uh, sequesters carbon, it stabilizes soil. Um, and obviously all that also protects our reefs and keeps our reef clean. Uh, next slide, please. So um, my crew and I, uh, we partner with multiple landowners and um, other agencies, and we strive to do our best at protecting and preserving what we have left of the cloud forest. Um, we are trying to protect what we have remaining from hooved animals like, um, like feral pigs, like the European pig, more, more specifically, um, wild cattle, goats. Uh, we try to minimize the spread of invasive species and pathogens. And um, also when places are protected, it's important to try to remove as much of the invasive species that are already there and have already taken hold. And of course we, um, we kilo and we monitor all the change that happens over time. And um, that's how we decide if we're doing a good job or not. And if we're um, answering our question. Um, mahalo everyone for listening and I'm gonna pass it on to Mahina Patterson. Thank you, Jake. Um, so in the last portion of our presentation, we'd like to highlight one of our newest endeavors, uh, the Pu'u Eke or Eke project. Um, and the goal of this project is to sustain an important water source for Kohala by protecting the forested summit region surrounding Pu'u Eke, uh, which is pictured here. You can see Pu'u Eke here, as well as our summit hill of Kohala, Komu Okale Ho'ohie. Uh, next slide, please. So the Eke project area, uh, pictured here with the yellow line encompasses the very top of the Ahupua of Kwaihai Hikina or Kwaihai 2, which is um, highlighted here in purple, which is Aina or land that was passed down by Queen Emma and is stewarded today by Queen Emma Land Company. Um, it contains some of the highest quality forests remaining on Kohala Mountain, uh, rising from its southwest flanks, bordered by pasture land, which you saw in the previous picture, to the summit again of Kumo Kalehoohie at 5,480 5, feet, uh, feet above sea level. And that uh, summit hill is in the top right corner. Um, and Eke is in the bottom right corner, just for some orientation. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as Jake was mentioning, uh, non-native animals and plants are the primary threats to the watersheds of Kohala Mountain. And so this project will focus on protecting Eke from further degradation caused by um, some of our primary invasive species, feral pigs and Himalayan ginger, by enclosing the 540-acre area with a pig-proof fence, collaboratively developing and implementing a five-year pig removal plan, removing 100% of pigs and Himalayan ginger, um, monitoring our impact by practicing kilo or, or direct observation and conducting water quality, vegetation, bird, and pig surveys. And finally, sharing about our work, learning and journey with the Kohala community, uh, partners, and funders. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, in Olalo Hawaii, vai vai, or the reduplication of vai literally means value, wealth, and importance, or in other words, abundance. Um, so towards greater ecosystem abundance, we expect the following outcomes from this project. Uh, 540 acres of cloud forest protected, the exclusion 
um, and removal of 100% of feral pigs, reduced spread of rapid ohia death, removal of 100% of Himalayan ginger, increased native plant abundance and biodiversity, reduced sediment load in streams, and increased community knowledge, understanding, and stewardship of Kohala's cloud forest. Um, and we're really at the beginning stages of this project. Um, so we encourage uh, everyone, anyone uh, interested or uh, in, in participating in our talk story sessions about this project uh, to please contact me uh, at the number uh, here, 808-887-6411, which is our uh, Kohala Center, our main office line, and at my email, mpatterson at kohalacenter.org. Um, and again, we're hosting our individual and group talk story sessions now. So it's a great time to reach out and get involved and help inform uh, what, uh, what this project uh, looks like. So mahalo nui kako, mahalo James for having us here. Uh, I was fortunate to be born and raised in Waimea uh, and I have, uh, my life has been sustained by the waters of this place. Uh, so thank you for inviting us here. And uh, again, please contact any one of us if you have questions, feedback or ideas. Uh, we'd love to hear from our community uh, and here are our, our emails. Mahalo. Mahalo Mahina, and thank you, Jake and Liam. A wonderful presentation there to learn about the source of Ravai. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate your knowledge. Sorry, Jake. Oh, mahalo. It's good to see you. Aloha. Um, just, uh, you know, unfortunately, we're going to be losing um, Mr. Okamoto, Keith Okamoto. He has, a, he has another engagement at seven. So I wanted to pose just a couple of questions to him before um, he, he has to head off. Um, and this is really, I'm going to grab, I know we have a bunch of questions that came in from the community and some we had ahead of time. Um, we're going to try and capture these questions and send them to Keith in his office and then uh, post those questions up on our, on our website. Um, but I wanted to share a couple that came in, if you don't mind, Keith, uh, just to kind of capture a couple here that came in. Um, uh, and then we'll share the rest of you at a future date here. So. Uh, and I apologize for the break here, um, but just wanted to catch Keith before he has to go. Uh, so Mr. Okamoto, uh, the question really is about um, on the new water meters and, you know, this is talking about going back to infrastructure a little bit. Uh, is there gonna be, when might there be a lift on the restrictions for new water meters? Uh, for example, someone wants to change zoning from ag to rural and sort of subdivide a parcel. Presently, they cannot get an additional water meter and so they're denied the change of zoning or the subdivision. Is there a, a policy change in the works for something like that? Um, so yeah, that's where we're actually trying to beef up our, our capacity in basically all of our systems to provide additional water. But what we don't have is that much abundance of capacity to do really large scale developments. Um, because for us, that's not a prudent way for us to operate and, and run a business. Um, to have that excess capacity just waiting in reserve for something to happen down the road. Um, one thing I do want to share is that the change of zone and the subdivisions fall under county codes. And that's something that we actually were not, you know, um, instigators behind the requirement that a change of zone or a subdivision needs to install a water system that meets the department standards. Uh, to be frank, um, you know, a lot of places on our islands do just fine with rain catchment. Um, and we're cool with that. You know, we're not saying you have to be our customer. Um, we try to provide ways for anybody to become a customer if it's reasonably within a proximity of one of our water systems. But this question is one question, James, that could go on for hours, actually. Um, so uh, that might be time for another, because I don't want to rob you guys of Yishan's terraformation you know that is a terrific project i think you guys really need to hear about that i don't want to steal any of his thunder uh, i was fortunate enough to visit his facility and, and came away very impressed um, and there is hope for us in the future because of, of folks like yishan uh, doing great things on our island so um it, yeah, again any other questions uh please email them to james um and uh he'll get them to me and, and then we'll get the, the responses back to you james if that's wonderful cool. Yeah, thank you so much, Keith. I really appreciate your time. Um, we'll see you soon. Aloha. Thanks, guys. 
Well, without, with that kind of said there, um, as Mr. Okamoto presented uh, about our next presenter, you know, really to continue this conversation off of the, the wonderful presentation from Liam, uh, Jake, and Mahina. You know, we want to continue this conversation of uh, reforestation efforts uh, while also considering alternative means of propagating and caring for any newly planted trees. Um, our last guest this evening, and I appreciate his patience, um, he founded a nonprofit operating here in Kohala to tackle the effort, effects of climate change. Uh, Ishan Wong was the founder and CEO of Terraformation, recently completed uh, the world's largest fully off-grid 100% solar powered desalination system here on Hawaii Island to alleviate water shortages that hinder uh, our arid ecosystem restoration uh, processes and efforts. And we felt it imperative to include in this conversation alternative and forward thinking um, uh, efforts that can help to maintain and even preserve our systems. So mahalo for taking the time to join us, Ishan, and, and welcome. Aloha. Oh, oh thank you so much. Um, aloha, everybody. Uh, well, I, I guess a, a lot of I guess, things talking about what we, we've done, um, there, there's, there's a lot of exciting developments in this area um, and you'll hear a lot of news about it. Um, so I think what might be more helpful is a, I talk about uh, the real challenges uh, and the real um, advantages um, that the, the new technology that's been developed um, could potentially bring. Because a lot of times when you hear about new tech, there's a lot of marketing hype, right? And so you know, hear about like, well, we're gonna save the world or whatever. But it turns out that saving the world or even improving it by a little bit is a lot of work and it's very hard. So I'm gonna talk about, you know, all the little nitty gritty things, how much it costs, how hard it is. Um, but uh, e even though that that's more realistic, that's, that's sort of what we try to tackle every day and how we can really move forward. Uh, so terraformation is, uh, you know, broadly speaking, we're trying to solve climate change. And we believe that the best way to make progress on that effort is actually restoring forests, especially forests in areas where you know hundreds or even thousands of years ago there used to be forests, um, and so one of our first uh, sites is in North Kohala, which, as some of you know, used to be you know that whole region used to be a sandalwood forest, but it was deforested uh, due to you know a variety of tragic events, um, and you know when you remove a forest, I, I think like having having now you know heard this great presentation from the Kahala Center, I think everyone understands, you know, if you remove the forest, it no longer traps the rain that comes in from the wind. Um, and so that's what causes the land to dry out and it's a self-reinforcing cycle where it becomes a desert. And I think if you bring the forest back, it restores the land's ability to trap the rain. Um, and that's what brings the rains back. So uh, I'm going to, I'm, just, just to let everyone know where we are, because we, we're actually out in the middle of nowhere. And one of the things that was pointed out to me was like, people don't even know we're here. Um, I'm gonna sort of show you, let me see if, let's, oh, oh, hold on. I have to let my computer do this. One second. Oh no. Hold on. Is this, is this, am I not able to do that? Oh no, I might not be able to show, share my screen because it's recording. Hold on a second. I might have to leave and rejoin. <laughs> I'll That's be okay. right back everyone. That's all right. Thanks, Ishan. Okay. Um, we can, at this point, we can kind of pose a couple questions to um, our Kohala Center crew, if that's okay. Um, so I'd like to welcome in, you know, just to, and Ishan shouldn't be too long here, but I'd like to welcome in a couple of our board members, uh, Michael Donnelly and Lonnie olson Chong, to share some questions that we could uh, pivot towards uh, Kohala Center, if that's all right. Mike, I'll pass it over to you if you're ready. Yeah, uh, thanks, James. Um, just just in general, it's just a, a, some amazing stuff. And uh, I think it's, as I listened to the briefs and I thought, 
My gosh, how, how can the community get involved? So uh, as, as I well know with uh, working with natural and cultural resources where I work, um, it takes a host of volunteers. So how can the community get involved and help um, the efforts in, in the different uh, areas that you're working on the Kohala mountain range? A uh, great question, Michael. Uh, Mahina or Jake, do you want to talk a little bit about Hawaiian days and um, some of the uh, meetings, I guess, maybe that you know, you'll be conducting meetings, Mahina? Or... Sure. Yeah, we, um, so right now we host Hawaiian stewardship days, which are our community stewardship uh, days and our most recent evolution of our of our volunteer days. So we host those quarterly. So that's a great way to get involved. Um, Huli Kalima Ilalo, turn your hands down to the Aina um, and, and offer some of your, your energy, your, your blood, sweat, and tears uh, to, to our places. Uh, those primarily take place in the uh, Kwaia Corridor and the Kwaia Tree Sanctuary, which, um, which are, uh, is about four to five miles on the Kohala Mountain Road uh, across from Pu'u Kavaivai, uh, if you know that Pu'u. Um, and so our next Hawaiina Stewardship Day is actually on December 4th, um, and we are very uh, mindful of the situation with COVID. We do require the wearing of masks um, and, and other protocols to make sure that we're hosting these events safely. Um, and although we would love to be able to host um, folks and be and, and allow folks to the opportunity to give back to our uh, cloud forest right now that's not uh, possible because of COVID we're, we're not able to offer transportation um, up to the cloud forest so um, again our, our work is focusing on the quieter corridor where we primarily do um, restoration uh, with through the planting of native plants um, and then in the quite a tree sanctuary which is a really special um, dry forest uh, on leeward kohala um, a really a special um, uh, a really special example of the forest that used to be um, you know more extensive as yishan was talking about uh, on leeward kohala um, and then again we have our uh, talk story sessions for the eke project um, and so that's something that you can come and participate in by reaching out to me. Um, we host those uh, individually and also in groups. And we're looking at hosting group sessions in November. And that's an opportunity for the community to comment on our project, to provide feedback, and to really guide um, uh, our project moving forward. And so we really welcome, um, you know, all of the voices from our community and all of the folks who drink the water um, of Kohala Mountain uh, to join us in those meetings. And thank I, you, see, I think Yishan's ready, so. Yeah. yeah, thank you for pivoting quickly and uh, thinking on your feet there. I appreciate your time there. Um, Yishan, sorry about that. Um, we'll have you back when you're ready to go. Sure. Okay, let's, uh, let's go visit our... Um, our facility over in North Kohala. I'm gonna to try to do a little fancy thing here. Let me know if this works. Okay, there we are. So this is our uh, facility. This is the, um, the place that was described as the world's largest fully off-grid, 100% solar powered desal facility. Um, and you can see, if you zoom out, it's, it's right here on the North Kohala coast, um, exactly, almost exactly midway between Kauai and Havi. And if you've ever been out there, you'll know that there's no water and no utility service out there. The, um, the, the utility service sort of comes down here from the north and Havi, sort of comes up here from Kauai up to Kohala Ranch, and then it just stops. And there's this sort of I want to say maybe like 15, 20 mile stretch where there's just nothing. So our facility is right here in the middle and you don't get any water, you don't get any power. So we have to provide all of our own power and all of our desal. Um, we have a brackish well. Um, and so we have to purify that water and turn it into fresh water so that we can irrigate. Um, you can sort of see the rough outlines of the property here. It just happened to be there. Um, and uh, 
using the solar power, we're able to purify the brackish water and turn it into fresh water so that we can irrigate all 45 acres of this. Um, this satellite photo is actually a little bit old. Um, if you come by or, you know, the scan, you'll see that there's tree planting across the entire um, property there. And the reason why desalination um, is going to be very important in the next 10 to 15 years is because, like, as we've heard actually today, throughout all of human history, almost all water sources have come from the mountains. The, in the mountains, the cool air or the cool area of the mountains causes warm air coming from the oceans to cool and condense and become rain or become clouds. And so all of water distribution throughout almost all of human history has been about how to take water down from the mountains and use it and split it and you know distribute it in an equitable way um, and you know people have conflicts over that you know water rights like what if you take the water upstream and then the guy downstream can't get any um, and you know an enormous amount of of invisible infrastructure is built so that we can have water just on the ready in the faucet right like Keith talked about this um, and I was actually really, really glad that he had his presentation to explain all of that because basically gives everyone all the background on the water. Um, but recently there's been a development which um, could potentially change that for the entire world. So some 50 years ago or so, the ability to desalinate water from seawater, uh, that is to say to purify uh, seawater from fresh water um, was invented. Um, and that was really great except that it was extremely energy intensive. And economically, it was just like not something you could do. Um, and in fact, for a long time, until very recently, the only places where you could, where it was economical to use desalination uh, was when you had very cheap fossil fuels and, which, and where there were no other sources of water. And that was primarily in the Middle East where you just, you don't get any rain, but they've got lots of cheap fossil fuels there. So they use desalination there. Um, but that's not something the entire world can use because if you use fossil fuels to desalinate all the water that the world needs, that's an enormous amount of emissions. It, it would just it basically destroy us. However, um, solar prices have dropped dramatically in the past few years. And that actually changes the nature of the entire game because if you can power desalination, <laughs> Huh? If you could power desalination okay. with clean energy, um, then we have another source of water uh, and we can potentially produce fresh water near the shore. And then users near the shore don't need to take water from the mountains. And so it's like kind of a you know, big cooperative thing. Um, and so this facility is relatively close to the coastline. And so we have brackish wells that are fed mostly from infiltrated seawater. And so what we're able to do is with this solar array, we're able to produce enough, uh, um, we're able to produce enough power to desalinate enough water to irrigate this whole area. It's also approximately the amount of water you would need for about, I think it was 20 homes. I don't remember if I did the math correctly. Um, so, you know, you could have about 20 homesteads here worth of, you know, water usage. So that's our little project over there in North Kohala. Um, and let's see if I can like switch screens over here to some numbers. Uh, no, that's not that. Let me see. Here I've got just a little illustration of how much the, uh, the system roughly costs. Um, so there are the solar panels, um, there's the desal arrays, which are surprisingly less expensive um, than you would think. The solar panels are also dropping in price quickly. Um, and of course, there's, you know, it's not free. You have to put it all together. You have to put piping in, you, have, you need inverters. Um, and you can do it with batteries if you want it to run 24 seven or you can do it only when the sun is out. 
Um, if you work on these solar projects, you know that uh, one of the problems is if you want to power your home completely with solar, the sun's not shining all the time. So you need batteries and batteries are expensive and that they are what make a project uh, sometimes not um, But with solar desalination, you don't need water at night if you can just store it in a big tank. And so instead what you can do is you can just desalinate during the day. Um, you, do, you do more desalination during the day, you store it in tanks and then you just have the water at night. So you don't need batteries. And that makes it um, much more feasible to switch desalination over to solar power uh, compared to sort of switching your house or your business over to solar. And that means this transition can happen years before uh, doing residential conversions to solar. Um, and the power or the sort of water output that we get from that system is about 34,000 gallons a day. And that's roughly the amount that we calculated that we would need to irrigate the entire um, piece of land there. Um, amortized over 20 years, and this is a very, very rough calculation, you get roughly a, a cost of $1.90 to three, $3.11 per thousand gallons. Um, and this is comparable to some municipal water sources. Now it's worth pointing out that the best usage of this is not actually to be competitive to municipal water sources, it's not actually to compete with and replace them. It's actually to provide an alternative so that areas that are served with existing municipal water don't come under as much pressure. Because one of the problems that's actually facing many places in the world, but especially islands, is increasing water usage is stressing the traditional water sources. So being able to do this in near shore areas allows us to provide people ag and agriculture with water uh, without having to just place an increasing strain on existing uh, water supplies. Um, in fact, let me just like flip over to another little map. I'm gonna, I'm actually, actually gonna take one of, um, I see some messages too from chat. Oh, okay, there are questions. Um, I'm gonna flip over to another window where I'm going to crib one of Keith's maps and, uh, and show something really, really interesting. So uh, this is that same region and this, this is where, um, you know, we have our current water infrastructure. And you can see that we actually deliver mountain fr or water from the mountains all the way down to the resort areas on the coast. Um, in fact, you see this like blank, blank region where there's no surface, no service, that's where we are. And we've, we've been able to prove that we can create and generate fresh water there um, in a reasonably economical manner. But currently we are piping water all the way down from the mountains to the resort areas. And so the obvious question is, or the thing that this enables us to do is if all these coastline resort areas were able to produce their own water, we would not have to take water from the Kohala mountains to service them. It could all remain up here. Um, and that leads to um, lessened desertification in many, many places in the world. Uh, sort of inland areas are becoming desertified because coastal regions are taking so much water from inland. And so if we can produce water you know, worldwide in coastal regions, we don't have to move that water as far. So that's also less expensive. And the water can recharge those aquifers. So if we flip back to, um, yeah, this document, I think, no, that's not the document, this one. Sorry, I have a very crowded desktop here. So um, there are just like a few extra things. Uh, for example, like the limitation is you need a water source. Um, I was a little reluctant originally to come to this meeting because I wasn't sure if it had become, you know, the people have gotten a mis had gotten a mis mistaken understanding that you could just use this anywhere. It would be very hard to use this in the mountains uh, because you don't, have, you don't have access to brackish water, uh, you know, or salt water or anything. Uh, you would have to drill an extremely deep well to get to any of that. Um, and so if you're in the mountains, it's better to use mountain water. Um, you can also use agricultural runoff. Sometimes that's available, like in uh, California's Central Valley, there's a lot of agricultural runoff uh, that's actually very difficult to manage, but this equipment can also um, purify that um, 
you with very, very similar uh, energy consumption. Um, but the main point is that it has changed the game just enough where it used to be extremely expensive to purify that water and you had to use fossil fuels in the past, but now you don't. With solar prices drop, we can now produce water in areas where we couldn't before from sources that we didn't have before. And we can do it with clean energy in a way that's good for the environment. So it's not a magical solution, but it gives us one more option. Um, and the, the one little key thing is that we were able to make it work out there in North Kohala. You know, I'm sure everyone's like driven up to Hobby or down from Hobby, right? And it's just like, it's dry out there, right? But we were able to produce water out there and we are restoring native trees and they're, they're actually thriving. So we didn't, we didn't know if it was gonna work, but it turns out it's, it's working. Um, and so as solar gets, continues to get cheaper, this option becomes more attractive. Um, and it's just like another tool that we have collectively in our toolbox. Um, but I think the key point I wanna make is that like, if you're a landowner, you can do it on your own, right? You, you, you can maybe do this if you're near the coast. I know a guy who lives, uh, he's, I think he's like down by, uh, I don't remember where he is, but he's like down by the coast past Kona. He has a house there and they don't service, they don't, there's no water ser service there. So he has a desal, solar desal thing for his house. But really the main benefit is if we are cooperating as a community, because um, if resorts or somebody who's near the coast can use this to get water from the sea, it reduces usage from having to move it down from the mountains. Um, yeah, and, that, and that's, you know, I think like the main thing. And uh, I've talked a bit about this with Keith when he came to visit. And, you know, I, I try to emphasize that, you know, there, there's a lot of marketing around things and nothing is magical, but this is a pretty important development, both economically and technologically. And it means that we all have this other tool that we can potentially use. Um, and the cost, the cost gets better and better over time. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's actually going to change the world in the next 10 to 15 years. So I go around telling people about it. Um, yeah, so, you know, thank you for listening to this presentation. Thank and you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. It's good to see you on here. Good to have you join us and really talk about the possibilities that we have as a community um, and some of the things we could also think about and open up our minds to. Um, I, I really want to respect everyone's time, and I really appreciate our presenters being on here this late. Um, so I want to really call a hard stop in, a, in a, about 7.30 here um, in about seven minutes. So, Mike, um, did you want to pose a couple other questions here to our presenters while we still have them on here? And I have a couple as well. We'll see if Mike jumps back in. Mike, you there? Sure. Um, just bear with me. Yeah, I am. Um, just, I'm here. Not a problem. I can jump in with one right now, Mike, if that's okay. okay there we are. So, um, so I'll, I'll just jump in right here. Um, really, this is a question for you, Sean, since you just wrapped up here. Why did, why did you choose Hawaii Island? What, what made you uh, draw, draw to the Kohala coast and consider that as a, as a place for this enterprise? You know, I, I don't have what you would call a very good rational reason for this. I'm drawn to this island because I love the spirit of this island and the volcano. That's like the best way I can put it. And I, and I think I began the work out there. Um, normally, you know, I, you wouldn't think that that area out there is like the most magical place, but you, if you go out there and you're just standing there in the middle of sort of this windy desert, right? It's all it's brown everywhere. There's a certain magic. And I, I don't know, like I could feel the spirit of the ancient sandalwood forest or something. I, I, I don't really know. I don't have a good answer, but there it's, it's, it was a sort of magical personal thing where um, I was drawn to this island and I was drawn to that corner of the island. Um, I didn't know at the time that it was such a remote place. I didn't know that like nobody really lived on it. I just happened to be out there one day and I was like, you know, there's something about this place. That's my best answer. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> appreciate your honesty. Thank you so much. The heart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, appreciate that. Thank you. The, and I'll pass it back to Mike here in a second. The other question I had was about, um, and this kind of came in from the live feed as well, 
you know, when we consider uh, desal operations and desalination efforts, there is a, a byproduct typically. What is, what is um, uh, how can we uh, alleviate that sort of strain uh, of the, the salt and the, the brine um, byproduct? There's actually a lot of solutions to that. Uh, I'm surprised. Um, I'm gonna give you the, the funniest answer, which is what we do with it there, which is we just dump it into the ground. And normally, if I were to say that phrase, it'd be like horrible, right? Okay, except brackish water is only a quarter the salinity of ocean water. Um, and so when you, when you desal it and you have the brine, the brine is twice as saline as that, which means it's half as saline as ocean water. And because we're just filtering out the salt, there's nothing there that wasn't already uh, you know, in the source water, right? And so it turns out that in that area, in almost every coastal area, you do have saltwater adapted plants, right? So while you're making fresh water to irrigate all these, these trees so they grow optimally, you also have a bunch of plants that are saltwater tolerant. Um, and so in our case, we are able to use that brine to irrigate more plants. So we actually have this area where we, where we, dump, where we dump the waste, um, but it's actually like only half as salty as the salt as the ocean. And so we have this huge patch of green that's like just spreads out from that area. So that is, that's like just one solution, right? To the, the, the brine problem when it comes to brackish influent. Um, another one, which is the large scale solution that the Israelis use because they have a very short coastline but they have a lot of desalination. And so they really, really care about their coastline is they built a two kilometer long pipe out into the ocean um, and they disperse their brine out at the end of that pipe in a deep ocean where the ocean currents are you know, large enough and in high enough volume that it can disperse it without causing any problems. And they've done ecological studies of the marine life and found that it's okay. Um, the one thing you don't wanna do is you don't wanna dump the stuff on an, like right off the shore. That's the one thing you don't wanna do. Um, because that will harm the marine life there. So it's either you have to put it in the deep ocean where there's enough deep ocean water to disperse it, or depending on the concentration, you can in fact use it online or on land. There's also uh, emerging technology to actually further purify that brine um, to the point where it's so, you can get like more freshwater yield um, to the point where there's, the brine is so concentrated that you can centrifuge it and you just get like a salt cake and the salt cake uh, actually has economic value, you can sell that. There's another <laughs> method where um, there's a company that's figured out how to make carbon neutral cement using brine effluent from desalination. Uh, they contacted us precisely because we're a clean desalination, or well, we're the world's largest, right? like clean des desalination plant. And they, they wanted our effluent because they can make carbon neutral cement out of that using solar power as well. Um, and so I'm talking to those guys like next week. If they can do that, that's a total game changer because then you can use the brine as the input to another uh, environmentally beneficial process. Because if, if anyone knows about like emissions, like concrete and cement are one of the largest sources of emissions in the world. Um, but in fact, there's a lot of uh, limestone dissolved in seawater. And so, and so the, the the products that are filtered out like magnesium and phosphorus and calcium, uh, those can be used to make cement in a carbon neutral way. So I'm actually very, very uh, excited about that one, right? Because then that turns us into a totally circular economy. Um, but in the meantime, the, the short answers are there are environmentally responsible ways to dispose of it. And it's key to, and, and they're not hard. You just have to do them, right? There's just sites in the world that are like totally irresponsible that I hear about like, uh, but I don't remember where the other one was. Is it Madagascar or India or something? And they would just like dump it on the shore. So you can't, that's the thing you can't do. But there's a number of responsible ways to dispose of it and you have to do one of those. So. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate those answers there. It's a, a wealth of knowledge you have for yeah, sure. Yeah, sorry. I'm like really no, nervous no, about that, right? No, make amazing. sure I dispose of it correctly. <laughs> Definitely amazing. Uh, Mike, did you have a question that kind of you know, captures a lot of this uh, talk before station two or uh, bring in some of the Koala Center as well? Yeah, I think um, just if it, maybe 30 seconds a piece is 
Talk uh, for the Koala Center and, and for Yishan is just talking about the funding um, and just 30 seconds, how you get your funding. Um, and for Yishan, it's just like, okay, funding in terms of commercial versus private. Um, to talk, talk the money aspects, 30 seconds each. Go ahead. Who'd like to jump on we'll that start, one? We'll, we'll start with Kohala Center. Okay, well, funding is a challenging one. Um, we're, we're a nonprofit, um, and I'm still kind of learning about that myself. Um, but in terms of, of, you know, we get a variety. We have uh, grants from the state watershed partnerships program, uh, from the Department of Health, a 319 pollution runoff control program. Uh, so there are uh, state sources of funding. There's also a federal source federal sources of funding. Uh, right now we have a grant from the US Forest Service uh, landscape scale restoration grant program. So um, um, so we're, we're kind of constantly, uh, of course, constantly looking uh, for funding. And Liam maybe can speak yep. a little bit more to our private donations as well that we receive. Um, but that's definitely a constraint and something that we are um, you know, constantly looking to grow. Yeah. I think there's more than enough work on the mountain to be done. Um, it's really the funding that prevents us from being able to do um, all of the, the work that really needs to happen. Yep. I'll just say we could Thank use you. more private funding. So <laughs> bring it on, Mahal. 100%. 100%. <laughs> Thanks, Liam. Thanks, you Yishan, anything to add on to that one? Uh, yeah, one thing I just wanted to correct from earlier, I think it was mentioned that we were a nonprofit. Um, we're, we're technically not a nonprofit, we're a Delaware C Corp. Um, in my case, I incorporated as a Delaware C Corp um, just because I had run nonprofits before and they were sort of difficult accounting wise and you had to raise money all the time. Whereas as a Delaware C Corp, you can sort of raise money in like investment rounds um, and then you have a bit more time uh, to like do things in between. Um, and one of the things I think like many people have an impression of is like, if you're not a nonprofit, then you're like sort of money grubbing, right? And it's like, that's not really true. We're, we think of ourselves as a non nonprofit, which is to say, we have a mission and we don't have to optimize for profits. We can optimize for our mission, which is more forest restoration, right? Maximize forest restoration. Um, we believe that this is value creating because if you sort of think of land that's degraded or denuded or desertified, that's generally regarded as very low value land. Um, nobody really liked the land out there when, we were, when I was working on that project, right? It's just like, that's the corner nobody cares about. Um, actually, that's not true. Um, there's, there's a group that cares a lot about the coastline there. Um, but in general, if you can restore degraded land into thriving forest, it's generally agreed upon that you've increased the value of that land in a huge way. Right? And so we think that's, that's value creation. Um, I have been lucky in that I've known a lot of investors who have a very long-term view of value creation and they believe in investing in companies that will create value in the very long-term and they're very patient. So in our case, uh, we have been able to raise funding from those types of investors. There's an increasing number of investors who are, I guess what you call like impact investors. Uh, who want to see climate change solved, who want to see the environment improved. And they believe that that itself is just a very valuable thing to do. Um, so our funding right now comes from those types of investors. Uh, in, in fact, I would say like all of our investors are like that. I haven't found a single one that is actually like profit or returns oriented. Um, I, I do try to sort of pitch it like that. I say like, hey, we don't have a business model yet. We're just going to restore all these forests and that's going to be good for the planet. Do you want to invest? And that sort of causes them to self-select. Um, and so these investors are a little bit different from philanthropists uh, because philanthropists sort of, they give you money and then they just sort of like imagine that it's gone. Um, these investors invest, they want you to succeed at your mission and they're generally just happy not to have lost the money. If you can return the money one for one, but you've succeeded at your mission, that's what they want, right? So it's like a sort of different type of investment philanthropy. So that's currently how we're funded. Okay. Um, we do actually have a number of entities who um, 
pay for our services. Um, uh, we have sold trees in terms of their carbon offsets. Um, and so those are, th those business models also apply to us, but I don't really consider those yet our main business model. Like right now, what we're trying to do is successfully restore as many forests as possible. And we have investors who are very Thank patient. You. We want to back that. Wonderful. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Yishan. That's amazing. And, you know, it's amazing work that you're doing there with the seed banking, the reforestation effort. And great to hear from our Kohala, Kohala Center colleagues there too, and all the work that they're doing in the cloud forest and preserving and maintaining the cloud forest. And, you know, this whole conversation about Vi um, and the importance of it, especially in the Waimea area, the Kohala area. And it's really great to have all of you on here to uh, address the community and talk about these different projects, the different aspects of it, right? Um, so really grateful for you to be on here with us. Um, really want to thank Mike and Lonnie for, for jumping in and asking these questions of our presenters. Um, it's a it's lot, lot of knowledge here, right? There's a lot of knowledge to be shared here and a lot of Manao. And I encourage all of our viewers to inquire further with uh, these individuals about their projects. You know, we really wanted to give a glimpse of water of Waimea uh, and really the importance of it for our community here. And, and grateful for our presenters talking about this at length. Um, appreciate your patience and your time with us here. It's wonderful to learn from all of you. Um, also grateful for uh, the viewers on the call. Um, you know, mahalo for joining us this evening, um, really to watch the stream and learn about this and, and get curious and want to know, learn more. So thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and, you know, mahalo to all of our presenters this evening for joining us tonight. Thank you for taking the time to update our viewers and helping really to lead our community during this time, especially during this time. Um, you're welcome to revisit and rewatch this recording up on our, our Facebook page. We will also put it up on our YouTube channel uh, this weekend. And want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. So on behalf of the Waimea Community Association Board, I want to wish everyone good health, be well, aloha.